Well, good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure um, to welcome you all here. And Yuri, I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you, Diana. Can you hear, still hear me well? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hi. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Washington County Chambers 8th Annual Manufacturer Symposium. Um, my name is Yuri Kucharenko. I'm a service operations manager of our Hillsborough Applied Materials site. Um, thank you for joining us today. We are very excited to hear from uh, some great speakers this morning. But uh, first, the Washington County Chamber would like to thank and recognize the 2021 Manufacturer Symposium sponsors. Our title sponsor, Intel. And uh, if you, you can uh, use the reactions in the chat to applause, or you can just uh, unmute and uh, close. <laughs> so, and the four supporting sponsors are Applied Materials, Adverse Vacuum, Metafab, and Summit Bank. And this year's Energy Break sponsor is the PGE. So thank you very much. Um, it is my great honor to represent Applied Materials today on this event. Applied Materials is a global leader in uh, materials engineering for the uh, manufacture of advanced semiconductors. Um, applied Materials um, innovations over the last 50 years have fundamentally changed how the world works and the way people interact with each other through technology. Applied Materials um, help to make products such as the computers, mobile devices, and the flat panel display not only possible, but also affordable for millions of people around the world. Our expertise in uh, um, materials engineering is a foundation of incredible breakthroughs turning future trends like um, artificial intelligence, big data, autonomous vehicles, and the internet of things into reality. Our engineering solutions are used today to produce virtually every new chip and advanced display in the world. And we're uniquely positioned to help make possible a better future through the power of technology. We always keep great focus on our engagement with local communities and look at, looking for more opportunities to partner, contribute and uh, grow together. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Carly uh, Ritter. Northwest Region uh, Government Affairs Manager for Intel. As the Diamond Level Community Leader, Intel has long been a strong partner of the Washington County Chamber and the uh, and, uh, Washington County community. Their contributions to the local and regional economy include um, continual innovation and investment, as well as thousands of jobs created and maintained locally. We thank them for their significant contributions Please help me welcome Carly. Thank you, Yuri. And thanks for all you and Applied Materials do for the industry. You're a very important player um, in the industry and the community, so thank you. And welcome everyone. Intel is very pleased to sponsor the Chamber's annual manufacturing symposium. Um, and this is a really important um, discussion that we're gonna have today because the supply chain challenges that we've all felt over the past year plus in our lives uh, really shines a light on how important manufacturing is. And as we find ourselves in an increasingly digital world, not just in our current virtual lives like we are here today on Zoom, um, but our cars, the appliances in our homes, our communication devices, everything digital runs on semiconductors. And in case you haven't heard, there is a global supply shortage of semiconductors and we're feeling it in all of our lives in many different ways. Um, and as the American leader in semiconductor manufacturing production, Intel is doing its part to support the domestic semiconductor manufacturing and addressing the global supply shortage of chips. But Intel can't do this alone. And to address the scale of the shortage, we'll take all of our partners, both in the public and private sector, including our 500 and counting Oregon-based suppliers, to work together to accelerate investment in semiconductor production. 
And earlier this year, our CEO, Pat Gelsinger, outlined the company's path forward that really doubles down on our internal manufacturing network, which really sets us apart from the other leading semiconductor manufacturers. Um, and our CEO has big plans ahead for Intel. And this is really good news for Oregon. Our CEO calls or Intel's operations in Oregon its crown jewel because it's the heart of Intel's research and innovation manufacturing. And we've recently added another jewel to that crown at our Ronler Acres campus in Hillsboro. Mod 3 Fab is um, a more than $3 billion investment that will provide over 1.1 million square feet of semiconductor manufacturing capacity. Um, and these types of investments, as we know, create thousands of jobs for the local economy. Um, out at Ronler, we have over 3,000 skilled trades working on Mod 3, and they've recently achieved an incredible milestone, recently logging more than 10 million work hours on that project, which is just incredible. So even as the new decade has ushered in dramatic changes and increased global competition, Intel is confident that Oregon will remain the heart and home of its global manufacturing innovation leadership. And we are optimistic that the best days for Oregonians are ahead of us. So with that, I'm pleased to welcome our keynote speaker for today, Lisa Anderson. Lisa is the founder and president of LMA Consulting Group Incorporated, a consulting firm that specializes in manufacturing strategy and end-to-end -end supply chain transformation that maximizes the customer experience and enables profitable, scalable, dramatic business growth. She has been named in the top 46 most influential in supply chain by SAP, a top 40 B2B tech influencer by the Archetti Group, and a top 50 ERP influencer by Washington Frank. Lisa recently published Future Proofing Manufacturing and, a, and Supply Chain Post COVID 19, which is an ebook on successfully emerging and thriving post COVID 19. Thank you for being here with us this morning, Lisa. Excellent. Uh, I'm looking forward to it here. I will share my screen. Okay. All right, so you'd have to be hiding under a rock to not uh, have it be experiencing some supply chain issues and disruptions. They're worldwide and global. Uh, one of our clients, uh, had is typically speaking ahead of the pack and uh, moved manufacturing from, or most of their manufacturing from China to Vietnam prior to Vietnam becoming popular. And that particular client I was talking to last week and they are in the process of moving 80% of all of their manufacturing out of China and Vietnam to North America, and they plan to have it complete within the year, if not sooner. And they see that as critical to their uh, future, uh, future uh, success. So how do we get to this point? And uh, we're gonna talk about um, not only how we got here, but where do we go from here and how can we be successful as manufacturers uh, moving forward? So this is, this shows, it's a very simplistic, Old, old time view of what supply chain management is. Thought we'd start with where we came from. So from our customers' customers, uh, we pull through distribution, generally speaking, uh, have manufacturing. This is, again, very simplified. Uh, and we have supplier suppliers. So this is where we started. And then what we've done is we went global. So now we have manufacturing, distribution, logistics, uh, transportation surrounding the world, many connection points. It's become extremely complex. And, uh, and this is what has led to the severe supply chain disruptions we're having today with the pandemic. So our global supply chain has been completely disrupted. Uh, you know, the picture on the left shows how the stores looked in the beginning of the pandemic uh, when everything came to a screeching halt and we had panic buying, those types of things going on, on the, in the consumer uh, realm. Um, in essence, this is uh, representative of an unprecedented volatility and demand. Uh, 
the yeah, I, I was interviewed uh, 15 different times uh, by reporters about the shortage of toilet paper. It became like the most popular topic. Uh, how can we produce some more toilet paper out there? So uh, well, with that said, you know, we, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, you know, one of, uh, one of my clients was a, uh, is a food, uh, food bar manufacturer and their volume was, was an interesting representation of, of, of all clients as part of their volume dropped like a rocket. Uh, and that's the, the volume that they supplied to, um, uh, like doctor's offices and Starbucks stores, which all closed. Um, on the other hand, they also supplied like Costco and that uh, volume kept on going and maybe even increasing in the beginning because everybody was hoarding, hoarding food. So there, and they also supplied, uh, you know, other industries. Uh, and it was, it was quite interesting because you, their customers volume no longer mattered. It was their customers, customers and what was happening with that. So what, what really happened is, is that some of them went up like, like no tomorrow and other ones dropped, dropped significantly. So that's, that was the beginning of the pandemic. And ever since we've been going around with, uh, spurts and spurts and, uh, uh, jaunts, um, in the, unprecedented volatility and demand. The second piece that's happened here is, and it's it's massive, it's the misalignment of demand and supply. And that's the single, single biggest cause and remains the single biggest cause of all of what we see happening today. In essence, the wrong items are in the wrong place at the wrong time the opposite of what we would like it to be, <laughs> to be sure. Uh, so in the beginning of the pandemic, I'll use a, 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 a consumer example to just uh, be able to explain this. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we uh, it was like March, at least for the US. Um, Asia was down prior to that because they were locked down earlier. So they stopped producing in Asia and we were still, we were actually, our economy was doing great. And we were uh, buying all sorts of things. And then in March, you know, we came to a screeching halt and uh, locked, locked down. Uh, the clothes that were on container ships um, to be sold in uh, malls, like no one was going out or, or like online, People started buying online, but not clothes because they weren't going anywhere. So, you know, we they were bringing in all the right, all the summer season clothes and no one was buying any clothes. Uh, later, when we came out of lockdown, uh, we may, you know, we, we came out sort of slowly. We're still working from home, but we started, but when we started buying clothes, it wasn't summer clothes because that season was done, but the, they're still there. They were still like, coming into the warehouses and in the warehouses and, and um, the warehouses are completely full. Uh, so it's challenging. And in the meantime, China was shut down so they weren't producing. So we didn't have the next season's close. So it, everything just got completely out of alignment and we did have the wrong product, the summer season clothes in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, that's just a, that's just a, a retail example. The same thing was happening across the board. So and it was further exacerbated by the Suez Canal um, debacle, <laughs> which caused people to reroute ships and um, actually re uh, plan different modes of transportation to try to get uh, materials and product uh, to where it needed to go. Uh, we had the Texas storms, which caused new unprecedented volatility and demand uh, as well as supply. People started using substitutes for their products. And uh, we had changing customer needs because uh, customers, we're all consumers. Even, even though we work with businesses, we may lead businesses, uh, but we, we still expect uh, immediate um, satisfaction in essence. So we're, we're going to use substitute materials. We're not going to wait and, and shut down our manufacturing facility until something gets here uh, a month from now, two months from now. We're going to figure out a different way to do it. Uh, and 
some things we find along the way might just work better. So we're constantly evolving our needs. And then, of course, now we all have a labor shortage uh, with the great resignation that's going on. So we'll talk further about that. But this all created widespread shortages, extended lead times, and soaring prices. So even the best clients are, are struggling in this uh, environment. I have uh, a current client that is uh, in the uh, building construction industry, and they uh, um, are um, losing their, uh, th they're having to shut down their uh, machinery and equipment for a couple of weeks um, because of this uh, supply chain uh, disruption. So one of the other uh, pieces here, we have some common themes that are arising uh, with these, uh, uh, with this uh, new wave of uh, um, supply chain uh, issues. Uh, one is supply chain resiliency. And um, we're going to be personalizing and configuring our products and services uh, with the supply chain resiliency. Uh, we're gonna talk further about that. Another concept that is extremely important when you look at manufacturing is uh, reshoring and nearshoring. Uh, this client that has 80% uh, of their uh, products moving uh, to the US is an example of that. Um, as I was talking uh, with uh, the Wall Street uh, Journal reporter last week when he was interviewing me about this topic, uh, we were talking about the fact that not only are clients reshoring and nearshoring, but they're also expanding capacity. So the manufacturers that are here and are um, doing, you know, that are progressive are going to be able to take on significant volume. There's going to be more volume uh more potential for revenue growth than there's than there has ever been, ever has been in the past. Uh, probably since the Great Depression, there's never been a time when there's more opportunity to move forward. Uh, and if you're manufacturing and you're innovative and you have the opportunity to expand capacity, there's going to be partners, um, you know, knocking at your door every day, all day. So there's significant opportunity when it comes to reshoring and nearshoring. And then we're also gonna talk a bit about uh, one of the processes that has allowed us to na better navigate uh, this, these current conditions than any other uh, with clients and that's the uh, sales inventory operations planning. So all of those are under the theme of supply chain resiliency. Next is talent. We're going to talk more about the great resignation, which we've all heard about in the news. Uh, I can tell you for sure that every single client has is experiencing this issue and has concerns about uh, talent shortages. It's also a great reshuffling going on. People are changing careers. They're changing jobs. They are. Uh, there's just a significant. Um, people are on the move. And, and there's an increasing need of skills as we uh, uh, as we're digitizing and um, rethinking our uh, th rethinking our approach to talent. So the third theme is the digitization and um, the ability to translate data into insights. So we're going to talk about this further, but we want to like start with a jumping off point of a modern ERP system because that's required in order to meet these ever changing customer needs and the personalization and configuration that I was talking about under the supply chain resiliency, let alone if you're interested in making, uh, you know, being profitable and having working capital available. All right. So this also stacks up quite nicely with what the surveys are showing. So Thomas survey, for example, is showing that 83% of manufacturers are likely or very likely to reshore. That is a huge number. In 2020, it was 54%. So it's taken a dramatic jump up. And this is, 
this is absolutely what uh, we're seeing across the board uh, with clients. They are expanding capacity. They are moving, reconfiguring their supply chain. They're even vertically integrating in some cases uh, to gain control. Uh, and another one that I'd like to highlight here is related to talent, since that's one of the themes. At the time that uh, Deloitte did the study in 2020, over 80% of manufacturers were saying that talent was um, important. The talent ecosystems is critical to competitiveness. Uh, this number does nothing but increase. And an interesting number here too, is that 94% of companies were experiencing negative impacts to revenue. And I would venture to say that it's getting close to 100%. Every client, even the ones that are progressive, innovative, uh, are rapidly changing what they need to change, are experiencing issues um, where the supply chain disruptions are causing problems with the on the revenue side. So on the, uh, what do we do going forward? On the customer side, it's really changed a lot. We have to know our customers' customers. So as I was talking about uh, the, my, the food client example, uh, what the current, what our uh, first customer in line was doing, it, it would still be impossible to figure out what was happening with the demand. Um, until you got to the customer's customer. So you have to be able to look at what's happening further, further down the line. Uh, you know, another example of this is with a, uh, um, a healthcare products uh, manufacturer that makes uh, cell and gene therapies. They needed to be able to understand what their customer's customer's demand really was and figuring out how they could um, make sure that they can plan for the appropriate volumes. So personalization, configuration, and mass customization are becoming assumptions. They're no longer like innovative concepts. So we have to be uh, thinking what's next? What is our customer going to be doing and how are we gonna evolve the needs? So making sure that you have spent uh, significant effort in really getting to know your customers, the only folks that will be successful and separate from, from the rest of the uh, uh, competition in a, in a positive way and, and speed on by are those that are in tune with their customer needs and their customers' customer needs. And is really, it's we're one interconnected supply chain. So we have to be able to, um, coordinate and uh, uh, think with an uh, end-to-end -end supply chain viewpoint. From a uh, reshoring, nearshoring, reconfiguration standpoint, I've talked about this a bit. We need to be jumping to re-examine our risk. What we've certainly all discovered is that we had way more risk than we had intended to have uh, as the pandemic hit. So we need to be rethinking this. That does not mean we need to simply jump in the opposite direction and, and go all in because it's not that simple. The supply chain has become extremely complex. We have customers needs changing and not every company, even within the same industry is experiencing the same, has the same situation. So we don't all have the same end to end supply chain. We don't have the same customers. So we really need to be thinking about our supply chain, what makes the most sense, what's critical to uh, success. Uh, how do we, do we have backup sources of supply? And if we do, are we using those backup sources of supply? Uh, when I was a vice president of operations for a, a healthcare products manufacturer, we, we, we kept a backup source of supply and we, produce, we um, uh, purchased 20% of our materials. It was a critical material. We purchased 20% of our materials by this backup source of supply ongoing to the chagrin, let me tell you, of the board of directors uh, and our private equity backers because they, they cost slightly more. However, somewhere in that uh, time frame, we had an allocation of materials and we were able to, uh, we went on allocation but we were able to 
gain the, the uh, supply, whereas our competitors couldn't because we were actually uh, purchasing from them all along. So, you know, that's, that's just a um, one example, but it's something to be looking at. And then there's the idea of strategic inventory, which everyone is like somewhat over ordering an inventory uh, in, in today's world. That's not necessarily the right answer. It's looking at which inventory should be, you should be uh, bringing on board, or perhaps you just need capacity. And where is your capacity positioned? So that's where you got to just be looking at the reshoring, uh, reconfiguration, regional, a regional cluster like, like you have in Washington County. It's, it's becoming the most popular way to go forward because you can better control uh, the uh, outcome and you can, you know, you, you have shorter distances between your uh, connection points. And if you can uh, source critical materials within that configuration, you're going to be successful. The other thing is additive manufacturing, 3D printing. Uh, looking at these options because as we uh, as we're uh, ramping up manufacturing, how can we do that successfully? Um, in addition to automating, utilizing robots, etc., it could be how do you how do you um, print something customized to the customer's needs on the fly, and how do you do that in in uh, volume? It's a tricky question. Now this slide is a bit more complex, um, but it was so impactful that I thought it was uh, important to, uh, to include. So sales inventory and operations planning has been the number one um, vehicle for success in clients successfully navigating uh, during these, uh, during these uh, turbulent times. And it also has helped them prepare to scale. So what does this really mean? Uh, in working with clients, they have a sales forecast. Somebody has a sales forecast. They have an idea. I'm going to sell $300 million of product next year. But when you get down to what that means so that you can produce something, purchase something, plan for the right skills in your manufacturing operations, have the right storage available, none of those answers are clear generally speaking. So this, this process helps to uh, tie the, the, uh, the people, the processes, the data together, uh, and in a way that allows you to turn that sales forecast in dollars to a product level forecast. Uh, and of course, the definition of a forecast is, is that it's going to be wrong. So the key is, how do you get a directional view of what's going to be needed. Remember your customers' customers and your end to end supply chain. So turning it into a production forecast or a product forecast, if you have engineering uh, needs in your facility, you know what engineering resources and capacity will be needed, manufacturing capacity, skills, machinery, and equipment. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, challenges there. And we have uh, storage capacity and long lead time items. If there's something that's biting us today in manufacturing, it is absolutely those long lead time items. So how do we bring all this together in a way that will drive uh, the ability to scale and create more of a predictable revenue stream um, while being profitable and increasing working capital? This, this type of a process, which is not an off the shelf solution, but it's tailored to, um, to each uh, uh, manufacturing operation is, uh, has proven successful. So when we look at talent, there's, we, are in a, we are in a new era when it comes to talent. We have to rethink our talent strategy. We no longer are going to be able to hire the talent in that we've been able to do in the last many years, for, for as long as I can remember, we've been hiring in talent. Sure, we developed it too, to some degree, but we were really able to hire. It. That is no longer gonna happen. With the great resignation, the great reshuffling that's going on, we cannot, we're just not gonna be able to find enough talent. It just doesn't exist. So what are we gonna do? We need to be thinking about 
discovering hidden talent. Uh, and I've been consulting now for 16 years. Um, and prior to that, I was, uh, you know, uh, in, worked my way up the manufacturing chain to, uh, to be a vice president of operations and supply chain. And uh, what I have found is, is that in every single example, in every client, there is someone, at least one person that's overlooked, that's a hidden talent. That the good news for, for uh, a consultant is, is that it's a great find. I find we find those folks that are uh, hidden gems and we uh, we leverage you know their knowledge, and they have ideas of how to improve uh, the the current situation. Uh, and they're just overlooked because maybe they don't use the right words or whatever the reason might be. Uh, they exist in every single situation. I have found that. So finding your hidden talent is one, and then we're going to have to develop talent today. So instead of hiring talent. We need to be focusing a whole new, uh, whole new priority on how we're going to develop talent successfully, so that we can uh, retain talent. Uh, and retaining our top talent is absolutely most critical. So we could talk, you know, for hours about this topic, but uh, but we won't. Uh, next is we want to engage talent because actually, just you know, finding a way to retain talent. Um, well, in today's world would be great on its own, but really we want people who are engaged. So uh, one of our current clients uh, had, just like everybody else, their volume was significant. They could not meet it. We had to extend lead times. And uh, they were looking to staff, fully staff one production line in this particular area. Uh, to seven days and the other one to five days, which is a real challenge in today's uh, working environment. And they were successful in doing that by engaging their, the employees that were currently working on those uh, production lines, Ex you know, uh, engaging them in the process, explaining what was happening, uh, why it was important, um, taking their ideas. And then those folks recruited for them. So they found family, they found friends, uh, they put the word out and we're 100% staffed in this particular area, um, which is, as you all know, quite the miracle. So, uh, and then they had a record-breaking month and a record-breaking uh, uh, from a production side and a sales side. So most importantly, remember that people follow people. They don't follow companies. So. It's <laughs> really tricky here, but what leaders do you have? They don't have to be formal leaders. They could be informal leaders, but people follow people. Uh, I can tell you as, as a consultant with, with clients currently, there are examples on both sides of the, the road. And there are some that we are much more enticed to stay with uh, and want to help than others. And the, the employees are doing the same thing. So uh, just... It's, it's something to keep in mind. Now, we wouldn't want to forget this because this is probably one of the most critical areas as well. And that is how do we digitize and translate our data into insights? Because we are all overloaded, just overloaded with data. We have plenty of data. We don't need to be searching for more data for the most part. But what I can tell you is, is that probably 5% of clients actually make meaningful, directionally correct decisions with that data at the right time, because that's the trick. How do, we, how do we turn all of this information we have into something that we can make proactive decisions with that we can better support our customers' needs down the line and uh, you know, improve our uh, performance? So, I could talk about an hour. I could talk for at least an hour on this as well, but I won't. So I will uh, uh, just try to uh, capture a few highlights. First is use your ERP system as a jumping off point. In, in today's realm, a modern ERP system is, is really has to be the assumption because they're much 
better geared to um, tailoring to customer needs on the fly and uh, finding ways to better automate and uh, help you handle handle your navigate these times with fewer people and uh, in a way that's going to uh, still result in a uh, uh, profitable uh, future for you. So it's it's critical, a critical jumping point. Beyond that, though, it's, it's not enough. We want to be able to leverage advanced functionality. There's like, we could get into a lot of specifics. I, you know, we can, can always ask questions and, and I'm going to provide contact information at the end. So with lots of free articles uh, on my website. Uh, but there's advanced functionality, connectivity, and some additional technologies. The key here is, is that don't just follow the fad that's the latest one that you're hearing about in the news, which it you know, might be tempting because it's hard to say, what do we do? But it, the key is, what do we really need to do to support where you're going as a business and where your cust what your customers need? So be thinking about that um, as, as, we, uh, as you look at what, what functionality you should use. And then be thinking about your data, because as I said, clients, if there's anything that they all have in common, it's that they all have a lot of data and they don't utilize it uh, to make some critical decisions. So be looking at your data and figuring out how you can turn data into insights. And then as you get to that point, you can like them pursue predictive analytics and, and some of the more advanced topics. But like, let's just start with making good decisions that'll get us moving in the right direction. And then we can accelerate that. So to wrap, to wrap up, the question on everyone's mind is how long will it last? Uh, I get, get calls like frequently from uh, like it was on Fox News a couple of weeks ago, and they were asking the same question. How long is this going to last? So I could give you the, the commonplace answer of 2023, 2024. But the real answer is we're in a new we're in a new and next normal. Maybe we should call it an unnormal because it's not going to get back to any sort of normal. In essence, Customers are continually evolving their expectations, and uh, we are reconfiguring supply chains at a rapid speed. And those that succeed are going to find a way to be resilient, gain talent, which really means retain talent and engage talent, and that can digitize and turn data into insights in a way that'll allow them to uh, not have to be thinking about 2023, 2024. They're going to be successful today and they'll be set up to, uh, to uh, carry to the future. So I wanted to leave you with a, uh, um, a, a special report uh, that's uh, emerging above and beyond, some insights on just these topics uh, from uh, Manufacturing Supply Chain Technology Executives as a free uh, free special download, feel free to uh, sign up. And you also uh, can sign up for uh, newsletters. Uh, and there's like a plethora of information surrounding these topics. Uh, and I will um, provide contact information so that you can uh, follow up and, uh, and, um, and get and have, gain access to, to all of these uh, resources, whether they're the blog, blogs, videos, et cetera. And I would be happy to uh, take questions. I see that we have some in the chat. Do you want to, uh, um, does, does somebody wanna um, prioritize them for me or? Thank you, Lisa, yes. So we do have a few minutes for Q and A. Um, Sarah and I will be monitoring um, raised hands as well as the chat. Um, so uh, Sarah, do you have some, do are there some questions in the chat? Uh, yes, we have one from Bruce Coleman, the city of Sherwood. More than one person representing you. And if I could remind people to please mute if you're not speaking. Thank you. Um, Bruce, I will read your question for you unless you want to interject and ask it. I wanna, I'm not sure if it got answered. You can, you can ask it. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, when companies are considering reshoring to North America, is that primarily to Mexico, US, or Canada? If US, are you seeing trends within US where manufacturing is reshoring in terms of regions of the US? So all of the above. So folks are reshoring to North America. So what I'm seeing is, is that it depends on the industry. Certain, it depends on your requirements. So uh, what type of, uh, you know, is your product bulky? Is it heavy? You know, is, you know, what, what kind of transportation, uh, uh, if it is, it may be, you would want to put it closer to your customers. So you may not go to Mexico. If it has a high labor component, they're looking at Mexico. Uh, so, you know, there, it just depends on the type of product. And it also depends on the, as I was talking about the clusters. So, you know, regionalizing manufacturing, it, there could even be a cluster, however, that's uh, combined between uh, Mexico and the US. But they're basically looking at where, where are my uh, uh, raw material suppliers uh, where are my other, you know, where are my critical suppliers located or where could they be located? Uh, how important is that to the equation? Where are my customers located? What kind of uh, transportation do I have in the middle? What, where is the talent? Because there are certain industries that have, like, for example, in Southern California, it's historically had a lot of aerospace and defense. So uh, as does uh, Washington. And so you know, there's clusters of talent in those industries. So it, it, it there is, there's no one uh, right size answer, but what we're seeing across the board is that they're looking at uh, the total equation. And of course they're looking at costs. So, you know, high priced uh, areas, less likely to uh, attract companies than uh, areas that have lower costs. However, if your regional cluster happens to be in a completely different area, you you may reconsider. So unfortunately, there's it's a multi uh, multi angle problem, uh, but they're they're reevaluating everything, and for the first time ever, they're uh, saying, you know what, what where should we go? Good news is the world is our oyster, but North America is where they're going. Other questions for Lisa? Raise hand. Sarah, are you seeing any? I am not right now. Somebody raised the hand. Evan, you may unmute and ask your question, please. Yeah, I got to unmute. Um, yeah, with that reshoring, um, are you seeing or hearing anything about um, like a reallocation of funds since transportation costs are starting to start obviously if they're reshoring transportation costs are going to change or they're going to reduce um, are you seeing anything about reallocation of funds towards manufacturing process towards other aspects of um, of that that manufacturing process yeah absolutely uh, uh, I guess how do I put this I guess science are clients are becoming smarter if you will so they are they are looking at the more and more they're looking at the total cost uh, Actually, like uh, I had several uh, executives of some large companies say that when they first offshored, they were, you know, it was a board requirement, you know, they thought they would try it. And they found that many times it, it didn't actually uh, achieve the benefits they thought it would achieve in the first place, but they were already, you know, they were already there. So then they, then they had a new set of challenges to deal with. So over time, folks have started looking more at the total cost. Uh, and that does include things like transportation costs, inventory carrying costs, uh, you know, IP, those types of things. So they are looking at how do I, uh, how do I bring, the, of course, they're looking at how do I bring the, uh, how do I best service customers in a way that's the most profitable. So, you know, it have the least total cost. And so they are looking at, for sure, they're looking at investing in um, manufacturing capacity. Uh, they're looking at uh, investing in partners because it, you know, it's, it's not always fast enough to just certainly build a new plant because that's, that takes time. So, you know, they can expand more quickly. They can partner with people who already are um, 
producing like products or at least for part of it. So they're looking at all sorts of um, um, avenues and they're, they're much more willing to invest in, uh, well, at least the um, pro more progressive plants are investing in talent up front. So they're hiring on people, they're investing in technology and they're investing in um, uh, like automation, robotics, manufacturing uh, capabilities before they have the volume, which is something that hasn't happened in the past. I'm seeing that more and more and it's paying off because they, they are prepared uh, when the, uh, you know, the, the next disruption occurs and uh, people are coming, you know, they're, they're coming to them and they're staying. So I don't know if that, an does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, that answers it pretty well. Um, um, as as well, um, on top of that, because as you were saying, I'm just coming up with more questions. I don't know why, but um, um, that reallocation of funds. Um, when you say that they invest more into um, their people, are you seeing that into retraining? And is that is that entire model shifting for um, the idea of? Oh, a future pandemic may be coming. Um, how do we pandemic proof our processes? Yes, I am. I'm seeing that as well. So that there were several questions in there, and I think they're quite important. So I'm seeing them invest in. Uh, well, they 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 are still investing in hiring people, certainly, but they're also investing in developing people, and that that can be uh, mentoring which is more time really than, than anything else, but mentoring, uh, training programs, uh, conferences, how do you provide experiences to folks? So they're, they're definitely starting to invest more in people. I, you know, I'm also the president of the association for supply chain management in this area. And uh, we're seeing an influx of uh, progressive companies that are saying, you know what? I want to get everyone up to speed on our uh, on the basics of supply chain management and how to and uh, production and inventory control and those types of topics. So, seeing a seeing a wave there, and also in, on the consulting side, uh, definitely seeing a lot of clients that are looking for um, mentoring along with like how do we set how do we set our supply chain up for the future? How do we implement a sales and operations planning type of process that'll work for us? And how do we get all of our people up to speed so that we can sustain this successfully and involve them so that we can retain them? So I'm definitely seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of investment into people um, across the board. And I, I forgot your second question, but it was uh, pandemic proofing the processes oh, in the future. Yeah, yeah, they're definitely looking at uh, they they've become risk adverse now. So in a way, they've gone more to the other side than they really even should, because they're expecting every risk to now happen. So they're saying, you know, like, what if the worst happens tomorrow? What are we going to do? So they are absolutely thinking those things, and then they have to come back to reality and say, okay, now where should I invest? Where should I invest the funds that I've allocated? So I see other folks with questions. Do you guys want yes, to? Yes, I'm, um, I'm, I will just call on Representative Janine Solomon and thank her for taking time out of her day to be with us here today. Janine. Yeah, thank you so much, Deanna. And uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, and I apologize, I did come into the presentation a little late because I had a, an appointment before this, but um, I really appreciate this conversation. And I think I was following a little bit of what Bruce had said in the chat about automation and how that will affect um, future workforce, but I, I wanted to say that I was really excited to see Aloha High School students that are in on this meeting today. Uh, snaps to them uh, for being here. Um, I am really curious about when we talk about workforce development and workforce training, how do we show the benefits of this manufacturing job, you know, workforce, you know, the, the, the field to them? How do we show them that that is a um, field that they should um, get into, invest their time and, and training into, and how are we um, exciting them about this opportunity? Well, uh, you know, it's in the area that I uh, live, there's actually a lot of conversation about just that topic uh, because we're, we're heavy in uh, manufacturing and supply chain, and it hasn't traditionally been seen as the most exciting uh, 
career, but that's, that's actually really changing. And we actually did, um, it was kind of, um, out there, but we actually did a, uh, course with the nonprofit that I uh, lead as well for high school students on just this, uh, just this topic. But I think that one of the things is, is that, uh, the digitization of, uh, of manufacturing in the supply chain, the automation, there's uh, lots of different technologies that are out there that that is exciting uh, to folks and it's 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 enticing uh, enticing them to learn. Uh, so I think that the the good news is that uh, the ability to change rapidly and be resilient to uh, turn data into insights and you know find, find uh, you know hidden gems within your organization are things that are attractive to uh, to uh, students and to uh, um, even high school students college students uh, actually we uh, in this uh, association uh, that I uh, that I uh, lead in this area we have uh, five different um, colleges as well that are involved and they're some of the most impressive students like we have a we have a bright future we what we need to do as manufacturers though is we need to find ways to engage them in the process earlier and uh get their um get their engagement in manufacturing because i think it's it's becoming a uh, um it, it's become an attractive career again and so, to some degree the pandemic helped us i mean because if nothing else the essential workers have shown to be critical because we wouldn't be able to eat. <laughs> we wouldn't be able to shop. We wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, have safety equipment. So I think uh, we need to uh, leverage this uh, new uh, newfound appreciation for uh, for our career. So I could talk about it forever, but hopefully that answers your question. Tony, I'm going to uh, ask you to unmute and ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is, you know, we've talked about pandemic and supply chain disruptions, but I'm wondering how much um, geopolitical instability in the world is factoring into manufacturers' decisions to onshore or reshore, um, because it seems like that could also be on people's minds as well. Well, the progressive manufacturers are absolutely considering that because there is a um, uh, I've had led several webinars for um, uh, on for, on manufacturing related topics uh, for different groups that I uh, lead or belong to, and uh, we had like a political uh, um, economist uh, on one webinar and uh, international experts on several webinars, and really the consensus is is that there is more than just the normal if you will, mm -hmm. the unnormal supply chain risks that we're talking about. Like, all of this disruption is just like the uh, pandemic related disruption, but there is, uh, it's getting to be uh, severe in terms of all the political risks throughout the world. So that's another reason why folks are looking at coming, reshoring is on the rise and uh, partnering with uh, local or regional uh, manufacturers is, is the place to go. So I think there's vast opportunity and they're absolutely considering that. Executives, um, well, at least the ones that aren't, um, you know, under the rock of, <laughs> I wish this pandemic would end and I think it'll end in 2022, at, you know, six months in or something. Uh, everyone else is thinking, thinking beyond that because who knows what'll happen uh, politically in that amount of time, let alone weather related. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they're they're definitely looking at the political risks, and there's and the, if nothing else, they are uh, probably at an all time high right now as well, um, since the uh, you know you know the Second World War or something. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the other question I had um, has to do with: Do you see? Do you foresee a resurgence of uh, younger people entering the trades? I work with a few clients who are struggling. They're in, you know, manufacturing, machining operations, things like that, and they're finding just struggling, finding not enough people. Let alone the, you know, the situation in general with the labor market, but just there isn't enough people, young people, entering into the trades. And so I'm wondering if this trend of, you know, reshoring will have that effect long term, and if if schools are starting to kind of gear more that way. Well, 
it definitely is a, another edge of the, you know, the talent shortage here, to be sure. Uh, and, and it's going to continue to evolve things. So what I am seeing, though, is, is that students need to find out or realize uh, that there's these opportunities out there so they don't just... Um, it doesn't just come to them. I mean, because of the pandemic, you know, they've gained somewhat of more of appreciation for it. But like, for example, in this area, the um, like Harvey Mudd College, we've been working, with, I've been working with them, uh, the Keck Institute, they've been uh, really encouraging folks to uh, partner with business communities and understand uh, the opportunities that are out there and, and how they can be really quite exciting in, mm -hmm. in uh, the manufacturing field. So I'm seeing that start to take place, but it does require uh, progressive leaders on both sides, on the business community side and time, which is not something we have a lot of. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's dedicating time to this, this, to this, as well as like the, like, for example, Harvey Mudd, they hire, they specifically, they took couple of years, which I wouldn't recommend, but at the time they took a couple of years to find the right person. And they did find the right person. He's, he's great. But to head up their manufacturing um, uh, programs and he was focused on, and they were specifically focused on finding somebody with business experience so that they could start to um, uh, bridge that gap. Um, and then there's also more and more connections with the high schools as well. So, but it does, requ it does require uh, the business community, the um, uh, the public uh, people in the public space, you know, the governmental uh, um, related folks, uh, and the academic uh, community to come together to make this uh, happen mm -hmm. and to uh, make it exciting. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's true. Yeah, and I think um, I think it, it's a it's a slow ship to turn, right? I mean, it, it's taken it's over decades. It's kind of shifted away, and so I, I don't imagine it'll be an overnight, you know, resurgence of emphasis on the trades and attracting people to it. But yeah, with concerted effort. I imagine it will. It can happen. Yeah, and you know, and one um, one large employer in the area, one manufacturer, uh, really needed more of the folks in the trades. And so they actually partner with the community colleges as well. And um, we're offering, offering uh, courses and opportunities where they would uh, train folks. And, uh, um, you know, like if you, would, if you find out where they are today and you, and you give them something that, you know, would I like to I don't know, you know, what their opportunities are, but work it in and out or what I want to contribute something, you know, if you relate what you're producing and the opportunities to learn, um, you know, most, most people are interested in being productive and contributing to uh, contributing to the world and contributing to so you, it's how you present it. But then again, I go back to the need for leaders and right. <laughs> time right. and that kind of thing. Okay, thank you, Lisa. All right, we've got um, two final questions. I'm gonna go with um, Yuri and then Tony. And the one thing I would interject is don't forget the power of parents and getting parents engaged in students thinking about career paths and opening their eyes up to that. So um, Yuri, you're on. Hi, thank you. Um, you, you already uh, partially answered the questions. I was, uh, was preparing them. Uh, um, but uh, back to uh, workforce shortage. Um, your strategy for the uh, for talents is uh, um, mainly uh, the mitigation for the problem itself, right? We, we don't have uh, we don't have enough work workforce. So and and you know each one of us is trying to look into the the crystal ball and and, and trying to answer the you know fundamental question is how big is the problem itself of the uh, what are the trends? Um, how will it affect uh, the labor cost? Uh, how it will, uh, um, what, what needs to happen, what trends we you know, foresee in the future, what will happen uh, to solve the problem itself. Like we see right now uh, uh, some reductions in the, um, in the entry level position thresholds. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, what else do you see um, in your opinion? Uh, well, I mean, you know, Definitely clients are looking at how do I, um, to your point, how do I automate and how do I um, reduce the number of people I need because they can't even find people even for entry level type positions. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult to find people period. So they're looking at uh, 
technology. But then they're also, you know, I think they're going to have to be creative here because there's a more and more of a need for high skilled uh, people because, you know, the more automation, the more people you need to, um, that are technical uh, as well. So, you know, I think that client, the smart clients, I mean, it's probably like something we would never think about doing in uh, two years ago, but they're, you know, they may just bring on people that don't have the skills yet and uh, train them for a year before they even are productive at all. So like bringing them on and kind of growing them, if you will, over time, you never know, but they're, you know, and they're partnering with different, you know, I, I mentioned community colleges, but there's all sorts of opportunities to partner with groups and, um, like the chamber, like you guys are, are doing here. There's mm -hmm. a, there's a innovative program, but I think people are going to have to rethink things because they can no longer hire them. They're going to have to develop them. Thank you. Tony, do you have a question or Sarah, do you want to read Tony's question in the chat? That Tony Varela. Tony. Yes. Oh, all right. Hey, thank you. Lisa, thanks. Uh, uh, you know, great information to keeps us all up at night. Um, the question I had, and you kind of spoke a little bit about it, uh, but basically regarding reshoring, what are you finding companies are either doing or experiencing as they're trying to rapidly reshore to a supply chain, a local supply chain that seems to be at capacity, uh, let alone just the workforce shortages, um, but just overall throughput and capacity, it seems to be pretty full. So I wanted to get your take on uh, what companies are, are finding. Uh, you're right. Uh, they, it is it is full, which is uh, which is uh, quite the challenge. So in a way, they're having to do all of this at once. They're they're looking for uh, uh, people or companies that have the same type of capabilities that could expand in a um, you know different direction. Because it might be that uh, it's it's a, a better longer term path for them to change their change their product, if you will, and to, uh, uh, it, 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 so they're looking for base capabilities. How can they build and expand upon those base capabilities? Uh, how can they maybe create a, a cluster? Uh, can they, um, can they partner with, uh, I mentioned North America, because that's really where most of them are going, but there's also, you know, like South America, Central America, how can we, uh, maybe we can partner more with um, uh, manufacturing that's existing there. And uh, it's, it's really going to be quite the challenge because it's not as though you can just reshore everything that's in China anytime soon. So it, that's the problem. The more progressive companies are not waiting, though, because, you know, by the time folks who are uh, running at a... Uh, slower pace, get around to this, there's not going to be any opportunities for, for folks. And, you know, someone will have stolen all the talents and are developing it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's what you bring up is a really, is a really tricky um, um, problem. So they're really just having to think more creatively and involve, involve folks in like, you know, maybe it's the same capabilities, maybe it's a, a, a mothballed uh, plant, or maybe it's, um, supplementing your workforce with uh, like a lot of, even though there's this great resignation and great reshuffling going on, what are people looking for? More meaning, generally speaking, because they realized during the pandemic, they need more meaning. Well, how do we provide them with more meaning? Because there are some people that could reshuffle to manufacturing for sure, uh, if they realized how they could have more meaning in that role, or maybe it's, um, you know, part-time uh, work, and it could be uh, folks doing crazy things like providing, uh, you know, daycare and elder care. You know, like there's you know, there's all sorts of um, opportunities, but it's just uh, thinking through them. And it, it, unfortunately, none of them are easy. But it's uh, I think it's going to be thinking outside the box. Lisa, thank you so much. Um, I really, truly appreciate it. Great information, great engaging dialogue as well. Um, and really 
Thank you very much for being a part of our, our program here today. So we are going to move. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but I didn't want to stop the engaged dialogue that was happening. But it's my pleasure to um, introduce our panel facilitator. And you've actually had a chance to meet him, Mr. Tony Varela, with um, Hillsborough-based manufacturer Medifab. Tony is a member of the Board of Directors for the Washington County Chamber of Commerce, and Medifab is a bronze-level leading investor. Tony, thank you so much for participating and uh, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks a lot, Deanna. Um, yeah, so as Deanna mentioned, I'm with Metafab, where I'll spend a quick minute or two talking about who we are, what we do, and then we'll get into today's discussion. Uh, Metafab, we're a precision sheet metal fabricator. Uh, we're a contract manufacturer, which basically means we're taking, uh, building the prints of all of our, our customers' uh, specifications. We deal with everything from aerospace and the recent, uh, you know, excitement of space exploration, uh, all the way through to consumer electronics, to telecommunications, uh, hobby and lifestyle uh, type of customers. Um, myself, I'm a second generation manufacturer, and so I'm personally interested in kind of leading the next generation of domestic manufacturers, the late workforce, labor uh, shortages, and what we're doing about uh, correcting the ship there. Uh, it's because of this I'm excited to get into the conversation today with our panelists. Uh, this morning we're going to be hearing from two members of the manufacturing industry, each representing different areas of expertise. You can find their bios in the program. Sarah has uh, will be putting a link as well in the chat. I'll be asking them a few questions and then we'll have uh, about 45 minutes of the conversation and we'll wrap up the room with a Q&A session. So get your questions ready. Our first panelist discussing uh, workforce development trends with me is Kathy Bishop. She's the Human Resources Director at Gyra Semiconductor, their subsidiary of Alpha and Omega Semiconductor. And our second panelist speaking on R&D and innovation is Brian Osborne, Manufacturing Director for JSR Micro. So with that, let's get started. Uh, first, we're going to have a little fun with numbers this morning. So if you could please put the number of open positions you have available today in your company in the chat. And then for the next round, uh, excuse me, the next step would be in round numbers, please put the cumulative amount of salary for those open jobs um, in the chat as well. And if, if you have more than one person representing your company today, just select uh, somebody to participate with, with those numbers. And uh, We'll do some math behind the scenes. I believe Sarah and Deanna will get to work on that, and then we'll come back to those numbers at the end of our chat. So, uh, Kathy, I'd like to welcome you to our program. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we've asked you to address workforce development issues from both a now perspective and the future perspective for the manufacturing industry here in Washington County. Uh, Kathy, this first question is for you. As a member of the city's advanced manufacturing work group, you've been focusing on developing a pipeline through the high schools and now moving into middle school. How do you anticipate the pipeline changing, uh, changing that dynamic for local manufacturers over the next three to five years? Well, I think we've covered some of this already, but uh, again, this work group is instrumental in uh, trying to address this locally. Um, you know, it's when you talk to current employees in manufacture, people that have been in the positions for years, you know, you recognize that they recognized a viable career when they came in and saw something where, you know, they could grow. That pipeline somewhere along the line completely broke. We don't see that anymore. You don't see the 18 year old walking in the door thinking I can get a career. Um, now it may be an accident or something happened in their life where that college dream wasn't going to happen and you managed to get them. So the workforce coming together with the city, the chamber, the school districts, uh, community colleges, getting all those people at the same table and talking and combining our efforts to ensure that students once again recognize the opportunity for a career. Um, that they can, you know, graduate and start a career immediately that, you know, there's not a delay from high school to that start. Um, and that the path allows them to make a livable wage right away. Um, you know, that that's a pretty incredible thing to be able to offer to the students and it does get their attention. 
Uh, the increased pipeline, you know, not only funnels us students to careers, it can also identify and assist in developing current employees. I mean, we, we talk a lot about, okay, well, if we get them in, now what do you do with them? How do you keep them going? Where do we take them? And, you know, all of us at the table are saying, you get them to us, we'll figure out a way. But combining our efforts is helping a little bit more. I, I mean, I probably sounded a lot like Tony when I said that, because I know it's just get me people, right? We, we got to get them started. Um, you know, we have tuition assistance. The companies are willing to step up and help get people those skill sets and have to do it. It's not, you know, an option anymore. Um, and I think for most companies, you recognize that that tuition assistance does not get used enough. And it's something we're focusing on and trying to find ways to get people to engage in that. And that's kind of internal, I think, for most of the companies. Uh, but we had a student that started with us through kind of these combined efforts through an internship, uh, came to us right out of high school, did an intern with us, got hired on. Uh, this was in 2020, you know, a rather trying time for a lot of people to start their career. She walks in the door, recognized immediately as a high performer, uh, has since promoted, has also continued to go to PCC to get her degree. And I would say her income has increased at least 30% from the time she walked in the door. So, you know, it, it makes an impact. And, you know, I think that is really what we're talking about at the table with all of the folks. Great. You had mentioned uh, something along the lines of that, you know, that pipeline or that narrative breaking along the way. And I, I've been, uh, you know, working with you on the advanced manufacturing work group and something that I remember from very early on and one of the very early meetings, a room full of manufacturers, the question was asked, how many of our children are we talking about manufacturing with? And I don't recall a single person raising their hand of, of some 40 or more manufacturers. And so that's always resonated with me and uh, kind of reestablishing that, that message. And it, it starts with us as the manufacturers to kind of change that scene. So um, that's exciting work that you guys are doing there uh, with the work group. Um, we'll move over to Brian here. Brian, uh, JSR Micro is fairly new to Hillsborough, arriving in California in 2019 and investing more than $100 million in your new facility. For those of us who might not be as familiar with JSR Micro, could you spend a couple minutes and tell us a little bit about the company? Yeah, sure. Thanks for that intro, Tony. So yeah, my name is Brian, uh, the Director of Manufacturing at our new Hillsboro plant. Uh, we're, we're just off of Brookwood and 26. So we're, at, you know, kind of the western edge of Hillsboro, northwestern edge. And so we, JSR Micro is a global company uh, headquartered in Japan. So JSR used to stand for Japan Synthetic Rubber. Now it's just JSR. Uh, and we started as a rubber and butadiene company making tires for, for cars and then evolved into the semiconductor side. And now we have life sciences as, you know, those are kind of our three main pillars of our, of our global company. And on the semiconductor side, we have manufacturing in Japan and in Europe and uh, down in California where, where I moved up from in the Bay Area and then here in Hillsboro as well. And we've had an R&D facility over in Beaverton for maybe like the past eight or nine years as well. So just a small R&D fab um, or lab laboratory uh, to service the you know, semiconductor companies that are, that are in the area. Um, and so we're a material supplier to semiconductor manufacturers. So we make chemicals and chemical compositions that, that we deliver to the semiconductor manufacturers. And so that's really the bridge between kind of engineering and the, the dig digital side of things versus the chemistry side of things. And so that's JSR in a nutshell. Great. Thanks a lot, Brian. Hey, yep. we'll stay with you for this question. Uh, what current and future difficulties do you anticipate in creating the materials that will allow your company to meet the increasing demand of your customers? <laughs> uh, yeah, great question. So it's, um, I would say a threefold issue. So first there's the technological innovation or the chemical challenge. So it's finding the right chemicals, whether they're novel, like they've never been created before or whether they're existing and trying to, you know, fit them in a combination that will work well for the customer's application. So typically the semiconductor manufacturers, they, they usually have a twofold request. There's some kind of performance that you have to meet, like these chemicals have to do something when they put it onto the wafer. And then the other thing is they have to be active on the wafer and they also can't damage things on the wafer. So it's a uh, pretty common sense and pretty straightforward, but at the 
geometry size that they're working at where it's just tens of nanometers or even you know single digit nanometer feature sizes that are on these you know 12 inch wafers that's where it gets really difficult from trying to find the right chemical mixture that that's going to work and that will also be you know have, have a good business model uh, for jsr and also for the customer so there's the technical side of things and that's where it's kind of fun on the the mixing around with the chemicals then quality of course so i think semiconductor industry still has like the highest quality risk you know requirements of almost any industry out there you know there probably are some life science areas that are that may be a little bit higher but um you know they they generate water that's cleaner than anything that you know a human would ever need right because of you know their their quality requirements and so keeping keeping pace with that has been extremely difficult too because they're they essentially want to drive variation to zero so they don't want any change in you know the quality of materials so don't have any metals in there don't have any organics or inorganics all, all that kind of good stuff along with particles and defects and then of course there's the you know the environmental stewardship side of things and sustainability so we have to make sure that we're looking at the life cycle of the chemicals and making sure that they they comply with existing regulations and also the the regulations and requirements from the customer side as well and so that's part of what we did with the design of this new plant in Hillsboro is making sure that we have you know good capture systems and containment and a lot of safety systems uh, just because of the nature of working with chemicals Great. I'm always so impressed to hear the uh, dimensions or I guess tolerances that you guys are working on. I mentioned we're precision sheet metal shop, so we're dealing in thousands of an inch, you know, three, <laughs> three sheets of paper. It's, you know, it's real small. And then you guys start talking nanometers and my head just explodes. So a whole lot of respect to you and your engineers over there. Um, yeah. So, and, so with this conversation, obviously, uh, you know, we're all focusing on the problems and challenges, like I said, that are keeping us up at night, today's challenges, but we're also wanting to look at the future. Uh, so with that in mind, the next question, um, I'll, I'll let both of you answer this. Uh, we'll stick with you, Brian, and, and then Kathy can jump in. Uh, Dell Research shows that AI is on track to become our work partner and do the things we don't want to do or can't do. So how do we, you guys, as a <laughs> prepare for this <laughs> uh i think i think the best way to be prepared is to kind of go on the offense with you know automation artificial intelligence deep deep learning all, all those those aspects and just digitalization uh in general and that's been our ceo eric johnson has been one of his big pushes within jsr is a huge digitalization project internally uh and of course our customers are doing that as well i mean they're they're making the chips that can actually do the AI and then they're doing the AI on themselves as well. So it's uh, an interesting cycle in that respect. And I think, you know, there's always the concern that, uh, you know, what are the impacts to like the workforce and, you know, people right on the, the people side of things. But, you know, at least in my experience, what we found is that we've put, you know, more automation even into our chemical factory. It's relatively simple process it's not it's not rocket science by any stretch um, but we've put a lot of automation into it and so you may not need as many people that are doing the individual steps of the process anymore but what you need instead on the front and the back end of things are automation or controls or instrumentation engineers which is something i didn't even you know think we would need you know five or ten years ago and now it's one of the those are critical skills and technical know-how that we have to have like we can't have the factory running without that kind of experience so we have to plan ahead for that like there's going to be more of this and you know the ai is also going to be involved in the the chemistry side of things so instead of just uh, brian's going to go in the lab and mix some stuff together and see what happens you know you can actually feed you know some does or some simulations into ai and see what can comes out what can come out and so that's a competitive advantage that you know we have to take advantage of as well so we can you know create material mixtures faster than we could if we were just you know doing it one by one so again i think it's good to just be proactive with it and just realize that it's here it's already out there and so we have to take advantage of it where it makes sense for us and then uh, make sure that we have like the talent that that can accompany it and help to manage it awesome kathy to mirror the same thing i mean it's going to be survival um you know what we're seeing is we can't get enough workers if you take all the needs of the manufacturers in the area uh you know and look at what's predicted there there isn't the workforce to support that so you know being able to uh you know automate and continue is going to be critical in all of us being able to do so um, I think, you know, as we look around, um, that's what we're going to need to do. We've never seen, in my career, I've never seen the competition on entry level. 
Uh, and even if you look at what we used to call warehouse positions, which were normally your entry level position that you easily could fill, right? Look around now with Amazon and you know UPS and all of the companies that have come into the area. And those jobs are not what we would consider warehouse. I mean, those deal with a lot of automation and will continue to do so. So our world's changed a lot and in order to keep up you know, we're going to have to look at AI and any and every avenue in order to do so as technology changes. Um, it, it'll be what makes us successful or doesn't. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, so we're going to try to leave workforce issues to the side right now. Personally, that's hard for me as I think about this next question, but we're going to do our best. So uh, what are the top three challenges other than workforce? facing your companies over the next five years. Kathy, why don't we stick with you and then we can hop back over to Brian. Okay, I can't turn off the workforce part. I'm, I'm HR, come on. <laughs> oh. Right, I mean, the ongoing need for talent and you know, the <clears throat> ability to train them up, it's gotta make the list. So it's one. Uh, innovation and ongoing need just to stay ahead, I think is going to be very, very difficult. Um, but most importantly, the competition and challenge to keep manufacturing in the United States. We're seeing the trend of it coming back, which is critical. And if you look at you know, the challenges we've had to do so, um, you know, are we able to make that change? Are we able to go back to having manufacturing in the United States and do it successfully um, you know, and competitively in a global market? Uh, that's gonna be the biggest challenge. Sure. No, just, yeah, think, okay, not workforce. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, definitely Lisa touched on a lot of this in like, you know, her keynote, but uh, for, for us as well on the chemical manufacturing side, the supply chain short term is definitely a huge challenge. Uh, you know, we have chemicals coming in from all over the United States. We have stuff coming in from overseas. And if one ship gets stuck in a canal somewhere, uh, you know, it can, it can have like a, a lot of effects. Uh, and we felt those uh, for sure. We were seeing that. Um, we were really fortunate, I think, with the construction of our factory and that we started in 2019 before COVID and before the supply chain ripple effects really, really kind of hit the, the global scene. If we tried to build this factory now, it would take two to three times longer uh, just because there, there really aren't a lot of materials to, to source out there. So supply chain is definitely a a huge one. Um, second challenge, yeah, I just I go back to the quality side too, because I think over the next three to five years, you know, looking at that kind of short term view is there's there's always this gap between suppliers and the customer. Customer, they have things that, that only they can do. And, and in our industry, you know, semiconductor, you know, I think, yeah, yeah, basically like we were talking about earlier and, you know, Tony, you touched on it earlier, it's just the, the size that, they're, that our customers are working at they're the only ones that can build them and they're the only ones that can see them. Uh, you know, we don't build chips at JSR and we don't have the metrology to, to look at the dimensions that they do. So, you know, saying, okay, we think we're providing them with good material, but is it really? So trying to build that bridge with the, with the customer is a, a constant challenge. Uh, and I think the, the, the third one, yeah, is just trying to, trying to stay ahead of like trends in like the chemical industry itself. So, you know, there's the environmental side, automation side that we talked about as well. And then, yeah, what are some, what are some novel ways that we can approach, you know, safe and environmental and high quality chemical manufacturing um, that we haven't thought of before and that we might be behind the curve on, um, you know, because this isn't just like the petroleum industry or something or, or something where the quality requirements aren't so strict, but, you know, trying to make sure that we're being, you know, doing the quote unquote smart manufacturing as much as possible is another big challenge. All right, thanks. I'm going to let both of you guys slide on that one because I think supply <laughs> chain still is really wrapped up a lot in that labor force. And so it, I'll give you half credit on, on that one there. Um, I know it's mostly asking you guys questions, but as, as I ask that question, you know, I'm thinking even myself, you know, how much um, consumer habits or those consumer trends are changing. It seems like with the pandemic, we've kind of gone through this really uh, significant paradigm shift of both how we spend our time, how we spend our money, and, you know, just kind of all those values. You've mentioned, you know, environmental issues and concerns. It seems like there's a big shift that uh, is, is kind of changing across the market. And so, you know, I'm not sure how that all applies to the challenges that we're facing, but it does seem like there's some, you know, we're all going through some really, some really big times and challenges and, and uh, 
and opportunities there. So uh, <laughs> we'll jump into the final question here, and it's a two-parter. Uh, what is keeping companies like you here in Washington County and Oregon? And the second part is, where are the where are we at risk of losing our innovative advantage? And uh, real quick, I guess before we jump into that, Brian, if you could also touch on your relationship with the Oregon State University and, mm. and a recent acquisition, um, that'd be great. I'm not sure if that dovetails into this question or not, but go for it. Uh, no, actually, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good segue, I would say. So, yeah, with the uh, OSU down in Corvallis, so they within one of their research groups that spawned like a startup company called Inpria. Uh, and this, this company, they were novel in their approach to chemistry, like, like I was uh, touching on a little bit earlier, where uh, one of the materials that they make, it's a polymer, uh, but typically polymers are just like carbon and hydrogen, you know, just regular organic materials. And they infused it with metals. Uh, so it's like transition elements. So uh, hafnium and uh, other types of materials. So, um, you know, JSR recently acquired them, and I think we closed out on that just at the end of October. And so they're they're now like a full subsidiary of JSR, but they're going to operate, uh, you know, uh, currently as they are down in, in Corvallis. And so it it does kind of go into like you know for for JSR, you know, definitely one of the attractions of you know being in the Hillsborough area, Oregon in general, is you know the semiconductor manufacturing, the high tech era, you know, segment of the of the the company and the, the, the corporate uh, layout in the state. So having that here is, is a big driver. So, you know, there's a, Intel is here and is huge, a whole bunch of other suppliers. There's, you know, local supply chains that are set up. And then uh, of course, talk about it, I think all day is kind of the, the, the workforce too. So talented workforce that, uh, you know, in, at least locally in Hillsborough area, Intel, you know, drives and, you know, you know, gathers a lot of that, that talent. And of course, you know, we're a beneficiary of that as well. And so I think, you know, thinking longer term is just the, the same kind of um, benefits and positives that are here today are the ones that we should, you know, make sure that we continue to grow and continue to evolve and strengthen over time so that companies like JSR and, and others uh, as well can, can stay in the area. Because that's, that's the real danger, right? It's, uh, we're talking about finding the right talented people and then having like the companies and the manufacturing in the US so that we can, you know, all kind of come together and, and support that industry. And so, yeah, that, that also is part and parcel of why, you know, we picked up the Impre as well from OSU. Thanks. Kathy, do you want to refresh on the question or you got it? I got it. Got it. So, <laughs> for us, you know, AOS invested uh, by purchasing the old IDT fab, which is now Gyra. Um, you know, in doing so, they had the goal to bring manufacturing back to the United States. Uh, that is what keeps us here, and it's a success that we're able to achieve here uh, that has, you know, actually paid back to Alpha and Omega. Uh, so we are finally able to do that. We'll celebrate 10 years next year, but we are knocking out walls, putting in new machines, using every piece of space we have, and, you know, we're at capacity. So, you know, what's next? Uh, and we would love to stay here. We would love to use the talent we have to, you know, establish another fab, uh, but, you know, don't know if that's going to be in the cards, but uh, that obviously would be, you know, our goal and keep us going for a longer period of time here. Uh, very successful. It's great to see a lot of really fun products that we're able to, you know, put our, our touch on. So it, it's really been great. And I think we'll see a very long future here. Uh, the innovation advantage, you know, I, we're strong. We have, you know, a great talent pool uh, that is here. A lot of the people that were with IDT stayed on uh, and have continued to, con you know, just make this a great company. Uh, but, you know, that focus on advancement, new knowledge, staying up, uh, as well as, you know, as more people retire. Uh, which is definitely a trend today, I think, that we're all seeing. Uh, some of those are, you know, ones we weren't quite as prepared for as maybe we thought we would be, but making sure that we're getting that knowledge base uh, and continuing that knowledge base and attracting that talent and keeping that talent uh, is going to be what makes us not only successful here, but also successful in the U.S. Um, you know, we've hired a lot of entry-level engineers that we're training up that are catching on, getting mentored uh, very successfully. 
Um, we also will look globally for the right talent to bring in the door. Uh, so that will keep us here. And I think innovation, you know, in a technology company is just something that has to happen. And if you talk to any of your high level engineers, you realize innovation is built in and they are great at it. Great. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, thank you both to Kathy and Brian for a great round of questions and a good conversation. Uh, we started a little bit late for our section, but we're a little bit early, which means I probably didn't talk nearly as much as I normally do. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, Deanna and Sarah. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and uh, open it up to the Q&A. And again, you can either raise your hand on the video or kick a question or comment over to the chat board and I believe Sarah and Deanna will be keeping an eye on that for us. Do we have Rep any? Salman, you're up first. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both to Kathy and Brian and Tony for this discussion. Um, one of the things that kind of prompted me when you were thinking is I did a tour of international paper and I remember in the, their Beaverton location and I remember them talking about some of the equipment the, that they were starting to have within their plant. Um, and I asked them about that workforce issue of how are you attracting students right out of high school uh, to come work for you? And there seemed to be an issue potentially about possibly antiquated federal um, manufacturing laws on types of equipment uh, for a certain age range, uh, you know, age of students. I was wondering if that is something that is actually something that affects you or that you hear, um, if that's not something that we should think about as we're looking at automation and looking at all these types of innovative equipment, how are we um, making sure we're not missing that gap for those students that could come into this workforce? Thank you. I would love to take that question. <laughs> Kathy, go. <laughs> that is a brick wall we run into a lot. Um, not only is it an issue, you know, with the you know legalities of it. It's also customer based because most customers uh, you know operate globally and will in all their audits want answers as to do you you know restrict uh, and have employees eighteen or above? Do you have child labor? You know we run into that question a lot. Uh, we've been working with our uh, manufacturing group to try to do um, student. Um, actual apprenticeship programs so that we could bring them in early and start exposing and start them on a path for a career earlier. But we keep running into that same, you know, challenge of being able to hire and have people actually touch equipment that are under 18. Um, you know, most manufacturing environments are not the manufacturing environments of old. Uh, everybody has a lot of OSHA standards where, you know, safety is not the same issue it was when those laws came into effect, um, you know, and, and we need to address that issue and figure out a way to allow more of that, even tours and things like that, a lot of companies will restrict uh, those under 18 from going in and even seeing manufacturing, and yet we want them to see it as a viable career, but they haven't seen it. So, you know, it's challenging and it's something that we really do need to address. Yeah, and I'll add on to, to piggyback on what Kathy mentioned. So I think the same for JSR. So I think with the uh, Jira and Intel, they, they're our customers. And so we get the same feedback when we get, you know, audited from, from them and, you know, like child labor laws and, you know, the, the US 18 or older. So for us with typical recruiting and the onboarding, you know, starts at the 18 year old high school level or above. And like our internships are usually at the undergraduate level and, and above and graduate school level. So there, there is that space, you know, even in the, the earlier stage in high school where we, we really don't approach it just, just because of that, I say restriction, but it's just become like, it's just kind of a known thing. You just wait until they're in college. And then that's when we, you know, start like our recruiting drives and, you know, do college graduate drives and that, that type of, uh, push for, for new employees. Yeah, if, if I could jump in too, Kathy and I have had this conversation a few times. Um, you know, the work that we're doing in the advanced manufacturing work group, we recognize the fact that if, if we're starting in college, it's almost too late to capture for most mm -hmm. of the jobs that we're looking for. And so uh, Deanna mentioned it earlier in the conversation as well, you really need to start with the parents, parents and the school count, you know, guidance counselors. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of the bully laws, we're finding is that 
um, a lot of HR departments might just be firm in that old, yeah, it, not old, I mean, it's current law, but not want to find new ways. And there are new ways that you can get, you know, tours through with people under 18. But I know for myself, we ran into just the fact that it's just easier to go. No, it's, you know, no one under 18. Now, given that we're all more uh, familiar now with, you know, virtual, uh, virtual tools and resources, we've We've been able to partner with uh, PCC and created some pretty cool 3D walkthrough videos. It's not the same thing as getting your hands on it. And, you know, we haven't had live tours go through while the machines are running. So people get a real good sense of it. But it's small little steps that we can get, you know, start getting some traction. But, you know, you, we really do need to capture that, capture the interest in middle school and high school and then show parents mm -hmm. what a viable career looks like in manufacturing. And so, you know, great question. Tony, I would just say, and I'm sure every parent would have has also um, experienced this, that I lost significant influence over my children once they turned 18, right? <laughs> you know, as if I, you know, I might have had a small bit of brain before that, but when they got 18, I didn't know anything. Um, so yeah, I think that if we can figure out a way to to help parents understand the viable careers that um, and the the amount of benefits and the pay, um, I mean, is the it's an absolute trajectory into, you know, a quality of life and moving people up the income trajectory. And I think that that's just not being communicated. And there's this old thinking of manufacturing, you know, are they still doing that kind of thing. Um, and so it, it's interesting. I just think that there's great opportunity and to your point of, you know, let's figure out a way to, to immerse ourselves into um, that middle school environment, but include the parents and get them engaged in that as, as well. Great. Um, I think, Evan, you have your, your hand up as well. Uh, yes, uh, I had, I was wondering if automation has become more of a catalyst for your process of bringing a lot of manufacturing uh, reshoring manufacturing processes, um, as well as if it has, if there's any idea of if those automated processes and advancements in AI, if that's creating a barrier of entry to new, um, to new prospective employees, people who may want to get into these trades, um, into into these jobs if like all of a sudden something's different tomorrow or next year it's completely different day to day if those are creating barrier of entry for um for new employees so i can jump in on that one so yeah evan thanks for the questions i think um i think to the two parts of your question so the the first one about reshoring so i think it's definitely a driver uh in certain aspects because a lot of the the AI drive and deep learning drive, there's a lot of that in the universities in the US. So they're, they're, they are generating the talent that knows how to work with like deep learning or um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence type of, and automation type of systems. And you know, it's, it's a, there's a lot of code behind it, but then there's also like the, the actual systems and devices on the ground. So that, that you know, merging of the, the, the two is pretty, is something pretty unique that I think that we find in the U.S. And so that is definitely a big boost or a big help to, to find that kind of talent in the U.S. As far as like driving talent away and, you know, things changing day to day, uh, for sure. I mean, that, that uh, I think the area, especially for artificial intelligence is changing so rapidly uh, at such a, you know, very fast pace that it's pretty tough to keep up with, honestly. Uh, and, and you can see that I think the education system, government regulation, even like news media, just trying to keep up with what's going on or, or big, you know, companies like Facebook where they have to throttle back on like, you know, facial recognition and stuff just because the technology is so new and then they start putting it out there and then, oh, unintended consequences, good and, you know, and, and some, some good effects as well. Um, for us on the chemistry side, it, it's a little bit more directed. So, and it's because you, you have, you know, pretty rigid rules on what you're trying to feed into like the machine, like these are the types of atoms, here's the kind of bonds that they can make, and here's what we're looking for. But it is a special technique, like I'm a chemist myself, but I don't have the software background. I wouldn't be able to kind of mate the, the two together between the AI versus the chemistry. And that's kind of what you need. And so that's another 
new driver where it used to be the sciences are over here and engineering's over here and then you know software or computer engineering or electrical engineering is kind of its you know own little space and there's a merging i think that needs to happen uh, particularly in the, the chemical manufacturing area i guess i would say i think things have changed from you know where used to be very common for people to know kind of like one thing where they, you know, may know a programming language. So then if you change, you know, the company changes something, those people go out and you hire all new people. I don't see that as much anymore. What you see are these people, I think, because technology has been around longer, they learn quicker and are able to pick up whatever change you make. And you know, I, I, I think the talent is there. It just needs a little tweaking and we're doing a better job with that instead of out with the old and with the new. It, it just doesn't feel that way anymore. Maybe that's, you know, the value of employees has gone up um, and, you know, we're all looking for that base talent that you can take to the next step. But it, it just doesn't feel to me the same as it did probably even 10 years ago where you might see or hear of companies, well, they're gonna get rid of everybody because they're changing systems. Um, that, that isn't as common as it used to be. Evan, uh, you had mentioned, um, you know, the entry barrier for new hires in automation. And it's an interesting point. We have, uh, you know, very little, uh, little bit of, automation in our shop, cobots, robotic arms. And what I've actually found is the barrier of entry exists more so on bringing that technology in with the current workforce, understanding how to work with it. And, and again, I don't know if that's, you know, the idea that it's going to replace them or, you know, we believe that that's going to, it's called a cobot to work side by side and help, you know, help throughput. Um, but so much of that, I think, falls back down to the the messaging and the marketing behind whatever it is you're doing. And that's whether that's workforce and trying to develop, you know, a workforce or whether it's bringing in that technology, um, you know, it's just what what's the messaging behind that. Um, I look at the automation as it's it offers more pathways for vertical growth within my company. And so um, but again, that falls down to me and the other leadership group of expressing that and showing people where they can grow with it within our company and then within the larger manufacturing realm. So that's a good question though. All right, Sarah, do we have another question in the chat? We do from Jim Riley with the city of Hillsboro. Uh, Jim, thanks for being with us. His question says, currently the R&D tax credit no longer exists in Oregon. How important would it be to the success of JSR, Gyra and others in advanced manufacturing to have this reinstated? It expired in 2016, and the legislature has not renewed this R&D tax credit. Kathy, you want to go first? Do you want me to? I sure will. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't realize it expired. That tells you how connected I am with uh, the accounting and the <laughs> operation. But um, it was less paperwork for me for a couple of years, so... That was good, but yeah, I mean, any of the, the tax credits, things like that, that, you know, companies can leverage obviously helps because that money that's, you know, you're able to save, you're shifting that to people in most cases and in, a, you know, training, retraining, reskilling, um, all of those things. So any kind of tax credit that can be reestablished, you know, that is critical. And it's probably why a lot of the companies came uh, into this area to begin with. So yeah, I, you know, I think it would definitely help. Uh, there's a lot of other assistance and things that we still need to work on, I think, as a industry, but uh, everything helps. Yeah, and uh, I would agree with uh, with Kathy on that one. So every every little bit helps. I mean, it is, is it like a the biggest number one driver, you know, definitely not, but it's, it's definitely a nice to have, uh, you know, as long as it's balanced against like the, the needs of the community and the, the residents in Oregon and everything, I think it would be, it'd be fine. But I think in our other manufacturing in the U.S. is in California and in, in Sunnyvale, the, the Bay Area, and I think they still have like an R&D tax credit. And like I mentioned earlier, we we're just barely a year old with our manufacturing site in Hillsboro, but our R&D site in Beaverton has been there for, you know, almost a decade now. So uh, we've definitely been doing, you know, quite a bit of R&D locally uh, as well. Tony, I think that's it for the questions from the audience. Does anybody have a, a 
last question that they want to ask? They haven't yet. Any hands that want to get raised or question in the chat? All right, Tony. All right, I'm uh, I'm curious to see what those numbers turned up from the beginning of the QA. Is there, are we there? We do have um, an estimate, and I'll give uh, Zach, my colleague, credit. He helped me do some background math, so I can't take all the credit. Thanks, Zach. <laughs> Um, we have an estimated, based on the, the groups that responded, 85 to 105 open jobs, um, and that results in $7.2 million in salary. Oh, boy. So um, that's a big number. And the what, and I think that it, the reason for asking this question was not to point out your pain in terms of the number of, of job openings you have, but also to couple that with um, thinking about $7.2 million that is not in our local economy. Our small businesses have suffered. We, you know, this is an opportunity um, that $7.2 million is not in the local economy. And that is now um, a community economic imperative. This is not just a manufacturing industry, you know, issue. This is now a community issue. And it really requires the entire community to get involved with that because we really have to, um, we have to get those dollars out and recirculating into our local economy. What Think about what difference that would make. So um, I think this labor issue is something that is at a point of being very urgent that we need to figure out um, how to solve it. And um, while I know that uh, we we haven't solved it today, but I think a lot of really great suggestions for and participation in terms of thoughts and ideas of how we can't um, move some of these things forward. And I want to again acknowledge Representative Janine Salmon for uh, participating today. You know, obviously the legislature has a huge um, impact and a, and a huge role to play, whether it's um, the incentives that they um, start and stop or whether it's the rules that they make um, in terms of with Boley and other labor laws that um, we need to look at and find ways to think about it more innovatively. So um, thank you. And Tony, back to you. Great. It's a uh, it's it interesting to think about when it's that, you know, that total amount of money that's, you know, missing in the economy when you pull every job together and, and the salaries, that's impressive. Uh, I'd like to thank Kathy Bishop and Brian Osborne for participating in, participating in the panel. I think a lot of uh, great points were brought up. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, that wraps up the panel discussion. And I would like to hand it over to Troy Gagliano. Thanks, Tony. Hi, everybody. I'm Troy Gagliano with uh, Local Government Affairs team at PGE. And uh, PGE has been a longtime member of the chamber, and we're delighted to be a sponsor here today. So thanks, everybody, for, for being here and um, Deanna and staff for putting it together. Uh, if you're not a member, I'd really encourage you to join us. This is one of the top tier organizations. Uh, our team's a member of at least three dozen different chambers across the two states that we serve. And I can promise you this is one that's worth your time. Um, they strongly advocate for the, uh, the interests of local businesses and PG and I are honored to serve on the board. So thank you. And, and, uh, if anybody needs a reason to talk to me, to, um, to ask, to be involved, I'm happy to do that. So kind of just real quick on, on things PGE is doing and why manufacturing and the issues you guys are talking about, excuse me, matter to us. So for us, the energy business is facing some major changes in the way we generate power. So we have to continue delivering, you know, safe, um, affordable, reliable power, but our customers and regulators and legislature are all pushing us to make it cleaner. And that's a good thing. Um, PG's done a really good job of, of getting, you know, close to 15, 20% of our power we generate from renewables. And, but that's got to get that's got to get bigger over the next 20 years. And it's not just us, it's utilities nationwide. And uh, as a former wind and solar project developer, I can tell you it's astonishing and it's amazing to see how low the prices are for wind and solar. They are officially the cheapest options for us as a utility buying power uh, and building plants. So that's another good thing. So in order to make keep making it cleaner, we're going to have to do a lot of things using a variety of, of uh, not necessarily new, I wouldn't say wind turbines are new, but more emerging technologies. So you take PV and wind, uh, solar and wind. Uh, we're also going to need a lot of batteries to store electricity on the grid uh, going forward. Uh, also electric vehicles, all things transportation, electrification, uh, PGES and programs that helped land 
five electric school buses in um, some different Washington County school districts. So that's cool. So the manufacturing and supply chain things that you've been talking about are vital for us as we evolve the electric grid. Uh, so the topics we're, we're chatting about matter to us greatly. So thank you. Um, just really quick, uh, as many of you may know, the chamber took a significant step in July and changed its name to Washington County Chamber of Commerce. And as a board, member of the board um, that deliberated that big change over many months, it was really important. And that outcome was focused on increasing our ability to represent business community in a more intentional manner. And, and as part of that, some changes have occurred that are important to note. Um, and a few councils that have been created that I would encourage you to get involved with as well. Uh, one big change is the chamber hired full-time public policy director in government relations, uh, Zach Lindahl is a great hire, doing a good job getting us started off on that. I'm pretty sure this is the only chamber in Washington County that has that level of focus on what's happening at the county commission, the metro level. So they've got your back that way too, looking at the policy uh, side of, of our world. Um, so some of these new councils that have been included, you've got uh, education and workforce development, manufacturing, uh, land use and housing, energy and environment, and then transportation and, and mobility. So again, I'd encourage you to get involved and participate in some of those important conversations that are going on in those, those, uh, those councils. If you don't have the bandwidth, seriously consider one of your team members participating. I promise you will gain valuable insight and it'll be worth um, the minimal time commitment, frankly, that's needed. So really consider that. Um, so as you heard today, what's happening in Washington County in terms of uh, economic development, opportunity and job creation, certainly critical and your voice matters and you have a place at the table if you're willing to take advantage of it with the organization. So uh, contact Deanna or Zach. If, or, or myself, if I can help with any of that too. So thank you all so much and i um, happy to be a sponsor today. And so to close things out, I'm looking to hand it over to Gabe Wells with Summit Bank. Thanks, Troy. Uh, morning, everyone. Hello, uh, my name is Gabe Wells. I'm a business client advisor uh, with Summit Bank. Uh, Summit Bank uh, was founded in Eugene in 2004 by a group of local business owners uh, that had a desire for a community-focused commercial bank. And since then, we've grown to add an office in Bend in 2015 and then uh, opened our Greater Portland operations in 2019. And since that time, we have been a proud member of the Hillsborough and now Washington County Chamber. Uh, we provide full service banking, lending, and, and guidance to our clients. And from our founding uh, through today and into the future, we have been and are committed to uh, serving Oregon and South of Washington based businesses and nonprofits through direct access to a team of local professionals, top notch digital banking, and creative and flexible lending options. We're proud to be Oregon's business bank, and we are proud to be a member of the Washington Chamber of Commerce. So on behalf of the Chamber, I want to thank you all once again for joining us this morning for the 8th Annual Manufacturing Symposium. Uh, the Chamber cannot have this symposium without the support of their sponsors. So once again, thanks to our title sponsor, Intel, and our supporting sponsors, Applied Materials, Edwards Vacuum, Metafab, Summit Bank, and our Energy Brain sp sponsor, PGE. Thanks again to Lisa Anderson, our keynote speaker, speaker, and thanks to Tony Varela for being our panel facilitator and for our uh, panel participants, Kathy Bishop and Brian Osborne. Thanks to everyone who joined us this morning, and we hope everyone has the great rest of, rest of the week. I'll let Deanna close this out. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Gabe. And again, thank you all for your time and participation. Um, always a lively and educational conversation with our manufacturers. Um, truly a very important part of our, our uh, economic ecosystem here in Hillsborough, in Washington County, in the region, and the state of Oregon. So really appreciate all of your investment, um, your dedication and loyalty to Oregon. Um, thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day.